Now after this, the Shaykh moves on and we're coming to chapter 8 now of the book of the Qur'an and Eternal Challenge. Here he starts to talk about the levels on which the excellence and the superiority of the Qur'an is experienced. So he talks first of all about a passage of the Qur'an, meaning a collection of verses, around three verses, in which uh, a whole meaning is conveyed. Okay, as opposed to a verse which is actually connected closely to what comes before and after it, it needs its context. But something which is around three verses long, uh, or whatever length is appropriate to complete the meaning but that is imparted by the verses. This is what he means by a passage. And we remember that the Qur'an gave a challenge to the unbelievers to come with a surah like it. And when the Qur'an has said, bring a surah like it, this could refer to a long surah or a short surah. And the shortest surah, shortest chapter of the Qur'an is Surah Al-Kawthar, it is only three verses. As such, a, a unit like this is considered to it be enough to contain the meaning and to contain the challenge and the miracle of the Qur'an. So we're going to discuss some of the uh, aspects of the, um, the, the style and the uh, form of expression of the Qur'an. And by so doing, we're able to compare it with the limitations of human speech. You and I, when we try to speak and we try to fulfill a certain type of eloquence or we're trying to convey meanings, we come across certain limitations. We come across competing aims. The first example of this is in order to be concise but fully expressive. When we are speaking, we would either be able to explain everything that we want to say, in which case we need a lot of words, or if we, are, we only have a little bit of time or a little bit of space, okay, nowadays if you're writing on Twitter, you only have 144 characters, you have a limited amount of space, therefore you're not able to explain or to include all the meanings that you'd like to include. You have to choose those meanings, you have to select, maybe make one tweet and then make another tweet and continue that tweet, or use you know, one of these things which allows you to tweet for uh, longer. But the limitation of space affects the content of meaning. And including more meaning affects the preciseness and the succinctness of the speech. But the Qur'an manages to gather between perfect brevity and full expression. And Sheikh Daraz in particular has um, a theory or a perspective on the Qur'an that uh, brevity is, is, is it's one of its defining features uh, of its discourse. To the extent that the Qur'an from cover to cover, in his opinion, is uh, concise and succinct and to the point. And that's something that we will discuss in the next episode in more detail. So, the Qur'an manages to gather between brevity and fullness of expression. It doesn't have to compromise one for the sake of the other. As for any other speech, as for, say, um, the work of a great poet, we would find that at times they manage to achieve this. But say in a long poem, there will be a few lines where that is achieved to its utmost. And then they would themselves admit that if they had the chance to go back to that poem and rework it, they will always be able to go back and change it and fix it and make it better than it was before, which means that it was not perfect. It means it was not perfect in the first place if they can improve on it. But the Qur'an has come in its finalized form with its full brevity and with its full expression. Listen to the speech of Shaykh Daraz on this issue. He says, if you wish to see how these two qualities of precision and concise construction go hand in hand in perfect measure throughout a piece of work, you only need to look anywhere you wish in the Qur'an. You are bound to find literary expression that fits the purpose perfectly without leaning towards expansion or inadequacy. Every idea and every point is given in a clear and full picture. It is clear in the sense that it has no trace of anything alien to it. It is also full, omitting nothing of its essential elements or requisites. Yet at the same time, it is expressed in the finest and most concise style. Every word, particle or letter has a purpose to serve. The place of every word in every sentence and the position of every sentence in a verse and in a passage are carefully selected so as to produce the finest meaning flowing from one idea to the next. And this um, quality or this pair of qualities in the balance between them is expressed in one verse of the Qur'an 
which is the first verse of Surah Hud, of chapter number 11 of the Quran, where Allah says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alif Lam Ra, Kitabun Uhkimat Ayatuhu Thumma Fussilat Milladun Hakim in Khabir. Alif Lam Ra. This is a scripture with verses which have been set out with perfection. Uhkimat Ayatuhu. This refers to, among other things, its concision and uh, the packing the meaning into a small amount of words. ثُمَّ فُصِّلَتْ مِنْ لَدُنْ حَكِيمٍ خَبِيرٍ That it has been expounded and given in detail. Expounded in detail. Bestowed anew by him who is wise and all aware. And from his hikmah, from his hikmah is the ihkam. From his wisdom being wise, being hakim, comes the effect in the Qur'an or the quality of the Qur'an that it is muhkam that it is clear and it is precise in conveying its meanings. And due to his, his khibra or his being khabir, being all aware of all things and knowledgeable of all things, he expounds, expounds the details of the verses. The second quality which is discussed here in chapter 8 is addressing the general public and addressing select groups. Meaning addressing all people regardless of their level of education, the level of um, awareness and general knowledge and so on. We may say the ordinary people as such a general public. And at the same time, addressing uh, the educated elites, for example, people who with, with degrees, people with more advanced knowledge. If we were to speak to one group, we would find addressing speech directed at the general public that people who are more intellectual would listen to that and feel that it's not directed at them. Or if you spoke directly to them with that kind of speech, they would say that you're patronizing them. It's patronizing. Talking down to them, below their level. On the other hand, if you were to turn to a general populace, uh, or specifically to groups of people perhaps who are lacking in that kind of formal education, lacking in, in culture, uh, in reading and writing and so on, and you were to use technical terms to convey uh, a certain point, they would say, you're talking above our heads. This is highfalutin language. Who is it that you're trying to talk to? It's not us. So as such, neither does the Qur'an go over the heads, nor does it talk down to either group. And this is something which is a particularly uh, remarkable quality of the Qur'an, addressing the general public and the educated elites. We mentioned the verse before, وَلَقَدَ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ We have made the Qur'an easy to remember. And that means also to listen to it, to take its message and to take heed of it and to follow it. He has made the Qur'an easy for all people, easy for those of lower education and easy for those of higher education. And the scholars and the experts, whether they be scholars of linguistics, whether they be scholars of law, whether they be scholars of uh, spirituality, whether they be scholars of, um, of interpretation and whatever aspects a person is an expert in, or even scholars of science, and, and the natural sciences, whatever a person's expertise, when he comes to the Qur'an, he will find what addresses him and in the language and level which is befitting to convey the wisdom and the knowledge and guidance of the Qur'an. The third quality which he mentions here is speaking to the logic and speaking to the emotion. Speaking to the intellect or the brain, if you like, and the mind, while also speaking and satisfying the heart. Because as human beings, we are not purely rational beings, nor are we purely emotional beings. As well as our physical makeup, we have within us, whatever people may call it, however they may dispute, where, does the, where do these things reside within the body, or what is the relationship between these things and the body. We know that as human beings, we have the quality of intellect, which is represented by the mind, and is generally believed to rest in the, the brain. While the Qur'an also indicates that there is a role for the heart in that, but um, we also have emotion. Many a times human beings do things not on the basis of ration rationality. In fact, very often they do things against rationality for the sake of their feelings. Because that is part of human nature. We have emotions, we have feelings, we have sensitivity. You will find that there are some types of speech which are directed to the mind, especially the works of the philosophers or scientists. And then there are other types which are addressed towards the 
uh, the emotional aspect or the emotional dimension of a human being, or spiritual dimension if you like, such as poetry and even fine prose, creative writing, fiction, is supposed to make the imagination uh, soar and to appeal to uh, the feeling aspect rather than just the thinking aspect. But when, on the one hand, people are trying to educate about facts, they don't care, you know, in a scientific textbook, they don't care uh, when writing it. How nice does this sound? Is it going to be enjoyable to read? On the other hand, when poets are, are, are writing beautiful speech, effective speech, they're not necessarily concerned with how true is this, how accurate is this, because we have something which is called poetic license. Poets are expected to lie, and that's why in, the, in Surah Al-Shu'ara, chapter number 26 of the Qur'an, uh, which is called the poets, there is a reference here in, in verse uh, 224, that the poets are, are followed by the pe those who are lost in grievous error, and that they wander around and say what they do not. Okay, so in other words, that poets are, are drawn towards uh, telling lies for the sake of their poetry. Except the Qur'an then continues, says, except those who believe and do good deeds. So it is not all poets or poetry which is condemned, but only the aspect which is engaged in dishonesty. So the Shaykh says, if you want examples of this combination between the mind and the heart, read for example Surah Yusuf, chapter number 12 of the Qur'an, uh, or Surah number 28, Al-Qasas, both of which are concerned with stories and narratives, but they are not dry recollection of events, uh, then this happened, then this happened, then the next. Rather, they are full of lessons and morals and, and they appeal to the heart and the mind at every turn and every juncture. Likewise, those verses in the Qur'an which outline intellectual proofs, which present proof of the oneness of God, for example, uh, there are verses of this nature, but they don't come across with a dry philosophical presentation, which we find even in um, some of the books of the Muslim scholars who are trying to defend uh, Muslim doctrine, and they use certain philosophical terminologies to convey how it's impossible that um, there could be more than one God, because they say if there were more than one God, then there would be a contradiction between them, they would compete with one another, it would lead to certain logical impossibilities, it would lead to contradictions. Um, and in explaining that, they use words which are a lot more technical and complicated than, than what I just used. But the Qur'an has explained this meaning or expressed this meaning and more than that in the following words. And this is in, in Surah 21 verse 22. لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهُ لَفَسَدَتَا فَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَرْشِ عَمَّا يَصِفُونَ The translation of this, had there been in heaven or on earth any deities other than God, both would surely have fallen into ruin. Exalted is God, Lord of the throne, above what they describe. So, the argument is made here in the briefest of terms, in the most beautiful of terms. لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهُ لَفَسَدَتَا And that's enough for the Qur'anic style of expression. And then, words which appeal to the heart, فَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَرْشِ عَمَّا يَصِفُونَ And these are full of meaning which appeals to the heart, as well as the mind. And then even in verses which are concerned with law, with legal uh, stipulations and details, and there are verses in the Qur'an like this, so don't believe someone who tells you the Qur'an doesn't contain law, but law is, you know, sharia is something which is all uh, created by scholars. Rather, the Qur'an contains some details of law. On the most part, the Qur'an is giving us an overall picture and structure and the overall principles of law. More details are found in the Sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and then the scholars extrapolate from that to derive more details which affect all the issues that we face in our life. So they are taken from the Qur'an. But then we have some verses like the verse of, of Qasas, of retribution after someone has been uh, killed. Um, or you have verses to do with divorce and marriage and, uh, and being widowed and inheritance. These verses, although they are giving details of a, uh, of a, of a legalistic uh, nature, at the same time they manage to have heart softeners in the midst of them, to combine between them. Like the example he gives here of يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمْ الْقِصَاصُ فِي الْقَتْلَ الْحُرُّ بِالْحُرِّ وَالْعَبْدُ بِالْعَبْدِ وَالْأُنْثَ بِالْأُنْثَ in Surah, verse, uh, surah number 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 178. O believers, 
just retribution is ordained for you in the cases of killing. And then the verse goes on to mention the, the ruling of, of someone being killed in order, you know, in, in, you know, in retribution for having killed someone else, etc. And then among that we have words like Akhihi. It refers to, uh, you know, it refers to the, the, the murdered party as being the brother of the, um, those who come from the guilty party, that they are brothers. فَمَنْ عُوفِيَ لَهُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ شَيْءٌ From his brother. So it mentions brother in order to soften the hearts towards one another and say, because you are brothers in faith, so you should help one another. You should pay that money willingly. And you should follow up and not, uh, not delay and hesitate. So this meaning of brotherhood is there. بالمعروف, بإحسان, ذلك تخفيف من ربكم ورحمة. The verse says, this is an alleviation, a lightening from your Lord and an act of His grace. So even though the law is being discussed, there is there a beautiful indication of uh, God's care and God's uh, attention to your needs. And God wishes the best for you and wishes you to be guided by taking uh, His revelation and following it. And in that there would be success for you in all of your aspects of life. The fourth and final aspect that we'll mention from this chapter is the Qur'an being both concise and packed with meaning. Okay, or as the translation says here, general and clear. But the meaning I think is more like this, that the Qur'an may have a few words which are clear and in and of themselves uh, are straightforward to understand and to appreciate. But then when you ponder on it more and you reflect on it more, even as an ordinary believer, let alone as a scholar of the Arabic language and of the Quranic uh, norms, you can draw out more and more meanings. So you find a single sentence could be packed with numerous meanings. He gives an example here uh, from Surah 2 verse 212. وَاللَّهُ يَرُزُقُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ بِغَيْرِ حساب. God grants sustenance without reckoning to whom He wills. And when you translate it in this way, it may take away some of the meanings that we are about to mention. But in the original Arabic, it can have the following meanings. وَاللَّهُ يَرُزُقُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ بِغَيْرِ حساب. Number one, God gives sustenance. He gives provision to His servants without anyone accounting Him, without anyone asking Him, why did you give so much to this one and so little to that one? So God Almighty does not face questioning from anyone. No one has the right to question Him and no one is able to stop Him from distributing the sustenance or the rizq as He sees fit. This is one of the meanings contained in the verse. Number two, that when He is giving, when He is giving, He gives and gives and gives and gives. And unlike us, when we are giving, we start to look at our pockets and say, hold on a second, I only have so much left, I'd better be careful that I don't run out of money. Whereas God Almighty, when He gives, He does so without reckoning. He doesn't reckon and count His own wealth because it is unlimited. His provisions are unlimited. So he gives without reckoning. This is a second meaning of the verse. A third meaning is that when he gives the sustenance or when you receive it, you receive it from places that you did not reckon, that you did not imagine, that you could not have predicted where that sustenance would come from. Maybe you uh, are unemployed for some time and then you just happen to meet someone in the street and you get talking to them. Or maybe you see someone, you help him with his bag and then it turns out that he is able to offer you a job. Uh, which will alleviate the difficulty for you and your family. This is another meaning of the verse, Wallahu yaruzuku man yasha'u bighayri hisab. That people are not able to predict where, the, where it comes from. Number four, it can also mean, He gives servants their sustenance without first accounting them. He doesn't first ask us, have you been good? Therefore, I will give you your rizq. Have you been bad? Then I will not give you. No, without accounting us, bighayri hisab, without accounting us, He gives us the sustenance as he sees fit and as he wills and as he pleases. So this is the fourth meaning of these simple few words. A fifth meaning, and this is the fifth one that we mentioned, it doesn't mean it's the end of the meanings. It can also mean that he gives in abundance. The amount that he gives to his creation is without measure, cannot be counted, cannot be calculated, cannot be comprehended. So these are five meanings amongst other possible meanings contained in these few words Wallahu yarzuqu man yasha'u bighayri hisab And this shows us that the Qur'an manages to gather many meanings 
into a few words which in themselves are clear enough. But pondering upon it, reflecting upon the Quran is what draws out these further meanings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty calls upon us to ponder upon the Quran. When he says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Do they not ponder and reflect upon the Quran? Or are there locks upon the hearts? So in order to appreciate this reflection upon the Quran, we can turn to the tafasir or the commentaries upon the Quran where the scholars have drawn out whatever appeared to them, whatever uh, was clear to them of those meanings and we can benefit from them and we can add to them without saying that those thoughts that occur to us are necessarily right, are not necessarily what God intend intended but as long as they are in accordance with the general meanings and the principles of the Qur'an, we may say it is a reflection that has reached us uh, by the will of God. And with that we conclude this episode. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.